Hello and welcome to The Real News Network. I'm David Kattenberg. As Russia's assault on Ukraine grinds on, killing and maiming tens of thousands, threatening to go chemical or nuclear, it's clear that brutal armed conflicts sometimes have salutary effects. As the war rages on, down in Vienna, Iran nuclear talks are picking up speed, and there seems to be a connection. The aim of negotiations to revive the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or Iran nuclear deal. The deal's first incarnation was struck in July 2015. It seemed to be solid. Iranian compliance was confirmed twice in 2015 by the Trump administration, still under dogged pressure from Israel and its patrons in the U.S. Congress, in the spring of 2018, Trump reneged on the deal. Talks to revive it are now underway in Vienna, under the aegis of the five UN member states formerly franchised to wield nuclear weapons, namely the US, Britain, France, China, and Russia, plus Germany and the EU are part of those talks. Not surprisingly, negotiations appear to be lubricated by Iranian oil, with Russian oil and gas now under sanction, though still flowing, Western states are desperate to feed their fossil fuel addiction. Joining me to talk about all this today are Medea Benjamin and Elena Sokova. Medea Benjamin is co-founder of the U.S.-based peace group Code Pink. Among the powerful people, Medea has loudly but peacefully ambushed in public, Donald Rumsfeld, Donald Trump, and military officers waiting to attend a Halloween party at the Obama White House. Medea Benjamin is the author of 10 books, the most recent, Inside Iran, The Real History and Politics of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Medea Benjamin joins us from Washington, D.C. We're also joined by Elena Sokova. Elena Sokova is the executive director of the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation. Sokova co-authored a 2015 report entitled The Case for Highly Enriched Uranium-Free Zones. Sokova writes and lectures widely on nuclear disarmament issues and on the uh, peaceful uses of nuclear energy and technology. Elena Sokova joins us today from Vienna. Uh, thanks to the two of you for joining me today here on The Real News. Elena Sokova, let's start with you. Can you tell me where the Iran nuclear talks stand at this moment? And it might be useful to our uh, viewers and listeners to super quickly review just the history of the deal. I've kind of summarized the history of the deal, but if you feel inclined, you can, you can do so just concisely and tell us where the deal and talk stand at the moment. Uh, thank you, first of all, uh, for the invitation. I'm delighted to uh, be here today and also to meet Medea uh, virtually. Um, if we go back to the original 2015 uh, Iran deal or the so-called Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action as was negotiated in 2015, the goal for this whole deal was to avoid further progression of Iran in building up its nuclear expertise and its capacity to produce materials for a nuclear uh, materials of uh, quality and quantity that could be used for a nuclear weapons program. It took Obama administration several years to negotiate it. And you're correct, from the very start, we had um, EU 3 plus 3 and Iran uh, negotiating a deal. The, Iran, the, the original Iran deal, the best part of it was that it not only established limits on the Iranian nuclear program, its peaceful part, which is certainly connected to what could be utilized for military program. But it also established an extremely intrusive verification system 
uh, much beyond regular uh, inspections that are usually done by the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, in uh, other countries uh, with nuclear programs, peaceful nuclear programs. When Trump uh, withdrew from the uh, deal, because he didn't like uh, the deal from the start, I don't, don't know how much he knows about the deal and insides and out of it, but it was something that he, from the uh, presidential campaign, said that, that he would try to remove and negotiate at that time a better deal. Obviously, it didn't happen, but what deal uh, generated is uh, a gradual uh, Iranian dissatisfaction with the fact that the sanctions were put back on on Iran, and it started to chip away from the uh, key, uh, nor, uh, key key points of the Iran deal from 2015. Started enriching uranium to higher numbers, started to stockpile it in larger amounts, started using additional uh, centrifuges that are used to generate that uh, uh, enriched uranium. And if Iran had been Iran had been complying with the deal prior to the United States withdrawing. Am I correct? Absolutely. You know that there was no problems uh, regarding its adherence to the deal, and uh, every single dot was checked. And uh, the as I mentioned, there was a very uh, intrusive and very elaborate uh, verification system that was put in place to ensure the compliance with the deal. Um, but as uh, after the withdrawal um, and the reintroduction of sanctions, Iran, as I mentioned, started to um, uh, add new things that were not consistent with the JCPOA as possibly also as a pressure for the European countries and other participants in the deal to uh, get back uh, to uh, and remove sanctions. And some of these developments were quite worrisome. Um, if we have time and if you're interested, I'd be more than happy to talk about where we now, where we currently are in terms of the Iranian capabilities and what they have amassed since 2018 withdrawal of the U.S. Please do. And I mean, I'm curious to know, I think, you know, everybody wants to know what are Iran's ambitions. Iran has consistently said it has no intention of developing a nuclear weapon. Uh, now it's kind of transgressing the original deal because the U.S. reneged. Sanctions came back. Um, but where, where, where is it now and what are its ambitions, do you think? And where are the talks at this moment? There's a lot to talk about. Uh, yeah, it's a lot to talk about. But in terms of what Iran has uh, since 2018 able to do beyond, uh, far beyond what was agreed in the 2015 Iran deal, is A, to um, increase enrichment level of uranium. The original JCPOA, uh, the limit was established at 3.67% uh, uh, of uranium-235. This is the type of enriched uranium that you use only for nuclear power plants, like for fuel. Uh, gradually, it started enriching first to 20%, uh, and uh, more recently to 60% uranium-235. This material is also of a considered highly enriched uranium, and something that uh, with some uh, additional steps could easily be converted to uh, enriched uranium suitable for nuclear weapons. That is one of the biggest worries of in terms of what have changed since uh, the uh, Trump administration withdrawal and Iran responding uh, with some of this, uh, its own steps. Uh, moreover, there is uh, what we've seen in the last three or four months is the 
build up not only of the um, uh, level of enrichment, but also of the material that uh, they now have in their, in their possession. Do all these machines keep spinning and producing more materials? So what we had, say, in November is 17 plus kilograms uh, in, in uh, Iran. And now uh, the most recent report from the IAEA says they have more than 33 kilograms. That is becoming pretty serious. Uh, you add another, uh, I don't know, it's hard to tell uh, exactly, but if with that speed, that they may soon, within a couple of months, be have enough material to for at least one um, uh, nuclear uh, device. But they're still uh, under inspection. Is the IAEA still inspecting? The That's site? correct. They're still inspecting. Uh, they're still there, the IAEA, and uh, they continue to have access to most places in Iran, but there are a few places where they uh, do not have specific access, and that actually relates to one of the facilities that were... Uh, hit allegedly by Israel near the, one of the enrichment plants. So uh, even though the cameras are still working, the agency doesn't have access to the data uh, from that camera because it needs to be to come there physically and pick it, pick it up and read the data. Iran has uh, said that if it will eventually provide it, but Overall, on the whole, there is a pretty good functioning still uh, system of uh, various safeguards places, um, measures in place in Iran. So very quickly, uh, Elena Sokova, can you tell me where the talks stand at the moment? I, I mean, I'd like to talk about, explore with Medea and yourself what, what y y your thoughts are on Iran's ambitions. Um, <laughs> Um, but t t tell me what uh, t tell me where the talks stand now in a nutshell. That they actually, from what we understand, is at a very uh, uh, moment where it could uh, the deal could move forward very quickly. Um, even a couple of deal weeks ago, it seemed to have been on a path to almost uh, finalizing a little few things and signing the deal. Then, as you know, the war in Ukraine happened and the Russian foreign minister um, at some point introduced a demand that Russian um, uh, uh, implementation, both Iran deal and the Russian other economic cooperation with Iran should be exempt from sanctions, from U.S. and Western sanctions. Uh, that was at that point considered like one of the major impediments to the finalization of the deal. Ironically, it was actually Russia who played a very, very good positive role in both negotiating the original 2015 deal and the most recent uh, a negotiation that lasted, I don't know, for six, seven months lately that uh, led to almost concluding the deal. However, as we also know that in the end, it turns out that um, uh, Russian work on the JCPOA deal, because Russia is a key player there, it takes away that's enriched uranium, it provides other services for, for the implementation, is critical, and that is going to be exempt. So what I understand now, the, the biggest issue is uh, not about Russia standing on the position, but it, it is the uh, designation or removal of the designation of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards from the U.S. list of terrorist organizations, that is one of the remaining last uh, contention point. And uh, where are we going to go with that? It's a big question mark. Medea Benjamin, uh, you, you've been to Iran. You visited Iran uh, on, on how many occasions? Three. Three. Three times. Wow. 
Medea, what are your thoughts on 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 all this? And I'm wondering what what your estimation of Iran's ambitions are. Does it, you do you think Iran wants to develop a nuclear weapon? I think Iran wants a deterrent to being attacked and sees uh, the uh, examples of countries that gave up their ambitions uh, and uh, how they were invaded. Uh, as opposed to the case of North Korea, let's say, that has nuclear weapons. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think Iran wants to certainly get the sanctions lifted. Uh, it feels that it is quite hypocritical that Israel plays such an important role in all this when Israel has nuclear weapons that nobody inspects, that it's not part of a nonproliferation treaty nobody talks about. Uh, and so it does feel that it is uh, singled out. Um, but the way things stand right now, the sanctions have hurt Iran a lot. And the president, Raizi, campaigned that he would improve the economy. Uh, the only way he can really improve the economy is by getting these sanctions lifted, even if it's only uh, temporarily. I do want to fault the Biden administration for taking this long. Uh, on the deal, because it's something that uh, many of us expected would happen literally in his first week of office. He would just sign executive order, we're back in the deal. And so all this time has uh, created more problems. And of course, now we have the issue of Ukraine. And um, I think that it uh, also has given time for of uh, the Republicans to build up their opposition. We've seen in the last week that 47 Republicans sent a letter to Biden. That's every Republican in the Senate except for Rand Paul saying that they uh, have not been informed of what this deal is. They think it's going to be a bad deal. They think it's going to be even worse than the 2015 deal. Um, they are upset that it doesn't include the issues of ballistic missiles or Iran's role in the region, and that they will do everything they can to try to, uh, to um, see this either not come into being now, or they will reverse it uh, as soon as they have more control. And it's important for people to understand that even in Ob under Obama, this was not a treaty, meaning it never got ratified by the Senate, which in the case of a treaty needs two thirds. So he did not have that support. And so really it is uh, an executive agreement with UN Security Council approval that gives it a lot more weight. Uh, in this case, uh, it will be going to Congress, just uh, they have a chance to look at it and they, they, they won't be asked to ratify it, but they could reject it, they could accept it, or they could do nothing. And our hope, um, well, a hope would be that, it, that they accept it, but more realistic is that they do nothing and that this agreement then uh, could go into effect. Uh, but it's not done until it's done. We've been hearing, as Elena says, for weeks now. It's any uh, matter of days. Uh, we hope that is true, uh, but given how volatile politics are at this moment, uh, we won't pull out the champagne until the deal is signed. And of course, the whole you know the whole core of the Republican Republicans arguing points and Trump's arguing points and Israel's arguing points and even the EU is that Iran is a malign player. You know, Iran has, you know, proxies throughout the region. It supports Bashar al-Assad and it supports Hezbollah and Hamas who that are labeled as terrorist organizations. And it's advancing a nuclear program and it's just a threat to the whole region. It's the biggest terrorist state on the planet. This is what those, those folks amongst the Republicans argue. It's, of course, what Israel argues. What's your thought on that? My thought is that there's just way too many malign players in the Middle East, and it's uh, U.S., Israel, Iran, the Saudis, uh, and I can go on and on. I mean, the Middle East, the poor people there have been suffering for decades from all of these malign players. And um, it is uh, important that this deal be signed so that the U.S. and Iran 
uh, can talk about other issues. It's interesting that during this time, there's actually been talks between the two mortal enemies of Iran and Saudi Arabia, that Iran just broke off after the Saudis executed 81 people in one day, uh, including 41 of them Shia, and uh, Iran is Shia, and many of those Shia in Saudi Arabia have been discriminated against for uh, since the time of the founding of, of uh, the Saudi uh, regime. So uh, I don't want to justify Iran's actions in the region, but I want to put them in the context of this, um, these proxy wars that have been going on. And if you look at the catastrophic situation in Yemen, for example, you'll see that it was the Saudis who first got involved in an internal conflict in Yemen. Uh, and uh, later on, and quite reluctantly, I would say, the Iranians got involved. And then the U.S. pours weapons into the entire region, uh, making great profits for U.S. weapons companies, but making even more volatile situations throughout the Middle East. And then there's the U.S. $3.8 billion a year support for the Israeli military um, that just adds more fuel to the fire. So I think uh, given the situation in Ukraine, maybe people are a bit more sensitive about wanting to calm conflicts in other parts of the world, like in the Middle East. Um, that could act in favor of this nuclear deal and could also act in favor of the Biden administration following up the nuclear deal uh, with more talks with Iran. As long as we can keep the Republicans at bay, um, this could be a positive thing for the region. I'd like to ask you a question, Medea, and, and, and Elena, then you, after Medea, Elena, you can comment. Let's talk about this ele elephant in the room. It always astonishes me that these Iran nuclear talks go on and on and on. And you're reading the reports in the papers and in the media, and there's never, ever, ever any reference to, to Israel's own nuclear weapons arsenal. And Israel, uh, you know, launches new routine assaults on Syria. Just back in February, it launched an assault on a on an Iranian drone factory in in western Iran, and apparently almost wiped out Iran's fleet of drones. It just did it. Well, and, and Iran reportedly responded by attacking the Iraqi the base in Erbil, where the, the assault apparently reportedly came from, engineered by the Israelis. But should, should Israel's own nuclear arsenal be outed? Should Israel be brought into, the, into these Iran negotiations in the context of a larger uh, Middle East, uh, nuclear-free Middle East conversation? It's a... Maybe. Should they? Yes. Will they? No. And uh, it is, uh, I think, to a large extent because Israel has the cover of the United States. Um, not only does the U.S. give Israel uh, massive amounts of money every year, and let's remember Israel is a middle-income country, shouldn't be getting any money from the United States, uh, but Israel has also played an outsized influence in trying to uh, stop the U.S. from getting this deal with Iran. Uh, you might remember that during Obama's time, uh, Netanyahu came and addressed a joint session of Congress to say uh, that we shouldn't get into the deal. And then uh, we have the, um, the outsized influence of Israel in convincing Trump to pull out of that deal. And now we have Naftali Bennett, who has not been so public uh, in trying to um, influence the U.S., but certainly behind the scenes has been trying to do it. And this is, uh, this is very problematic uh, for uh, U.S. Uh, uh, politics, but um, it also does show to not only Israel, but people throughout the Middle East and Ilana, you'd have a better sense of this in terms of throughout the world, um, how uh, these international agreements and international law and all of this, you know, it's, it's all selective and it's all hypocritical. And so I think the fact that Israel is sheltered by the United States and let's face it, the Western countries as well, uh, you don't hear European countries uh, wanting to out Israel in terms of uh, making them 
uh, admit how many nuclear weapons they have and forcing them to join international agreements. But I would love to hear Elan on this as well. Yeah, Elena, Elena, tell, what are your thoughts on this? I, I wanted to add that uh, one of the um, uh, things that what we're discussing here is uh, whether it makes sense to engage Israel in these talks or not. I would say no, because it's complicated enough. And if we want also to look at the example of previous efforts to negotiate uh, or at least start negotiations of first the nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East or uh, WMD zone in uh, WMD free zone in the Middle East, uh, these uh, processes have proven to be uh, very unsuccessful, prolonged, and uh, dragging for years. Uh, we never were able even to formally launch the weapons of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East, um, despite the number of years spent on trying to revive it. Um, so bringing in Israel or bringing in other issues in the discussion of the renewal of the Iran deal is not advisable at all. Uh, if we want to make progress that needs to be, this issue needs to be kept separately. Uh, otherwise, it will, will just drown in and never reach anything. And I, I think I demonstrated uh, saying how much uh, Iran made progress in its enrichment program. It also gained additional experience in using more advanced centrifuges, also in... Uh, experimenting with the metal uh, highly enriched uranium. These are key uh, skills and knowledge that Iran is gaining. And what we need to do is to limit its capacity to move forward and make even more progress. So I would keep these two uh, things apart. Do you uh, not think, Elena, do you not think that if, if uh, it's hard to imagine, but if Israel's nuclear arsenal were to be outed uh, or, or if it were, it were to cease to practice this this policy of opacity. And I've even heard, read, read that certain Israeli officials are arguing that Israel should cease to be opaque about its own nuclear arsenal. That if Israel were to come in, as it were, that uh, would this not be added imp impetus to Iran to, to make that a extra added effort to to just comply, which it already was before 2018. Oh, I've heard this uh, calls on I Israel to uh, admit uh, its nuclear program, but uh, I'm not sure we're there yet because um, there will be additional implications in the region. And many of these diplomatic talks and forums that were dancing around this big elephant uh, in the room issue for a number of years, it's going to be uh, extremely difficult to contain. Uh, and uh, I'm sure the, the just formal admittance of uh, um, nuclear weapon status by Israel would also have uh, many of the other players in the Middle East who have been so far uh, more or less restrained in their own nuclear weapons admissions, um, ambitions. I, I just cannot cannot see how this can be uh, solved that easily. It's the issue we've been dancing around for a long um, time. But maybe Medea also has some of the points on it. Medea? Well, as I said, it's just not going to happen because Israel has the cover of the U.S. and the Western European countries. But I do think that even if this deal is sealed, uh, it is still a dangerous path ahead because it is not a treaty. And the next president could indeed pull out of it. And there we're back again where we were when Trump pulled out. And um, I, 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 Iran understands this very well. Um, I think it wants to get uh, the relief it can in the meantime. Uh, oil prices are so high, that could be a lot of income for uh, a, 
a government that is uh, in great need of cash. And, uh, but I think for the public to understand that without a, an equal treatment of all of the players in the Middle East, whether it's uh, vis-a-vis their nuclear programs or their ballistic missile systems or their, quote, malign activities in the region, uh, there will never be peace. And that's why it's important for us to call out these hypocrisies uh, and to really call for policies uh, that treat all the countries equally and try to get all in compliance with not only uh, nuclear agreements, but with all kinds of agreements for disarmament and peace. It was my original premise that I began this this conversation with that the 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 Russia Ukraine conflict is uh, and the, the uh, sudden crisis over accessibility to oil and oil pricing that it's lubricating the Iran nuclear talks because people see of course obviously Iran as as a source of oil is this is this premise correct Elena I would say in the current situation, it is correct. It's actually adding more uh, 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 kind of impetus for parties to uh, see the success of sealing the deal. But it wasn't that much of the case before the uh, uh, Ukraine um, uh, war. And because actually Russia for all, uh, I was surprised myself, I didn't follow the statistics as actually Russia was one of the uh, big um, exporters of uh, Russian oil even to the U.S. I'm not even speaking about the dependence of Europe, both on Russian gas particularly and on oil. So there is obviously, given the sanctions that are put on Russia nowadays, uh, the uh, importance of restoring the deal is, uh, gets a new dimension. And I think Europe is particularly interested in uh, having that to succeed because of the potential Iranian oil at some point uh, replacing some of the Russian oil uh, and gas. Um, But um, just one point on the restoration of the deal, assuming it is signed uh, within the week or so, it's not that simple as it were with the original uh, Iran deal. Uh, because there will be step-by-step different steps on the U.S. Western side and Iran's side. You cannot just magically overnight, let's go back where we dropped off before Trump withdrew. And uh, for uh, even the uh, Iranian oil to start really flowing somewhere, uh, it will take time. First of all, even after the signature of the deal, you would need at least two, three months just to prepare for these consecutive steps to happen. And one uh, 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 item uh, that is achieved and Iran then uh, rolls back some of the program, then we have the next uh, sanctions relief and other activities and then the next step in Iran. So it's a much more complex dance and much more uh, fragile dance that we'll have to do as compared to 2015 deal. Nadia, final points? I am worried that uh, given the Ukraine crisis, that there is uh, more uh, concern about Iran and its relationship to Russia and that that can add some more snags into this issue. We do have the supreme leader in Iran who says that it was the U.S. that created the Ukraine crisis, but the Iranian government is trying to be very careful, uh, uh, abstaining at the U.N. vote about Ukraine and uh, trying to not make this issue one about Russia and Ukraine. So hopefully that can be separated out. I, I think the world is in need of a diplomatic success and that this would be a tremendous gain, not only for Iran, but for all people who want to see the use of diplomacy over conflict. 
and perhaps it would give some momentum to the peace process with U.S. and Russia. And that's a big hope, but um, let's keep hope alive. Uh, thank you for that closing, uh, that closing idea, Medea. Medea Benjamin is co-founder of the U.S.-based peace group Code Pink. Her most recent book is entitled Inside Iran, the, uh, the Real History and uh, Politics of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Elena Sokova is the executive director of the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation. She writes and lectures widely on nuclear disarmament issues. Before you go, please don't forget to subscribe to The Real News YouTube channel and head on over to therealnews.com forward slash support to become a monthly Real News sustainer. Your contributions help us ensure we keep bringing you important coverage and conversations like this one. Thank you so much for watching. Bye for now.